Hi, welcome to what's a 95% confidence interval? Lots of scientific measurements are presented in terms of what are called confidence intervals. This is not just true in physics. In recent years, it has become a common way of reporting results in many fields. In this video, we'll specifically be talking about 95% confidence intervals because they are very common in reported scientific results. We'll be talking about what these confidence intervals actually mean. In particular, let's clear up a common misconception at the very beginning. If a 95% confidence interval is reported for some measured parameter, it does not mean that there is a 95% chance that the true value of the measured parameter falls in the reported interval. While we'll be talking about 95% confidence intervals, one can also define other confidence intervals like 90% or 99%. Those definitions are analogous to what we'll see here. In this video, we're going to assume that our measurement errors are Gaussian distributed. This doesn't cover all scenarios, but it is common in the reporting of scientific results. Okay, so here's what we're going to do in this video. We'll first give a quick review of Gaussian errors. Then we'll show how to construct a 95% confidence interval for the case of Gaussian errors. And lastly, we'll give the interpretation of this confidence interval. Now, there are a few concepts already covered on this channel that will be helpful for understanding this video. Although we will give a very quick review here, it will be useful if you're already familiar with the concept of Gaussian errors. For more information on this topic, you can consult the Gaussian statistics playlist. Next, the confidence interval is a concept from frequentist statistics. If you'd like to know more about what that means, you can check out the video Frequentists versus Bayesians. And lastly, while it's not as important for what we'll be doing here, you might also want to check out the hypothesis testing playlist. Okay, let's start with a very quick review of Gaussian errors. Let's say we're going to measure some physical quantity, which we'll call Q. Q might be, for example, the mass of a star or the population density of a certain species in a given area. When we make a measurement of this quantity Q, we'll get a result which we call Q measured. Meanwhile, the true value of Q is something that we'll call Q true. Q true is something that we do not know. Now, due to measurement uncertainties, Q measured will probably not equal Q true. For simplicity here, we're going to assume that our measurement errors are Gaussian we will call the measurement uncertainty sigma q. Okay, so what does this mean? Let's imagine that we did the experiment many, many times, each time getting a value for q measured, and take these experimental trials as independent of each other. The measured values q measured will be Gaussian distributed around the true value, Q true. Here we plot the probability density for Q measured. The Gaussian will have a standard deviation equal to the measurement uncertainty, sigma Q. Now, most experiments give results near Q true, but a few will be far away. 
q measured will fall between q true minus sigma q and q true plus sigma q about 68% of the times we conduct the experiment. This is represented by the blue band. And it will fall between q true minus 2 sigma q and q true plus 2 sigma q about 95% of the time. Finally, q measured will fall between q true minus 3 sigma q and q true plus 3 sigma q about 99.7% of the time. It's hard to see in this plot, but there is still a tiny bit of white under the tails of the Gaussian curve. Okay, so that was our quick review of Gaussian errors. Now let's talk about how the 95% confidence interval is defined. There are a couple of things that we want in defining our 95% confidence interval. First, we want a procedure to define the confidence interval from the measured value Q measured. The next criterion that we're going to apply is that we want the procedure to be such that if the experiment were repeated in many independent trials, 95% of such constructed intervals would contain the true value Q true. So now let's see how we construct the confidence interval. Now we said Q measured will fall between Q true minus 2 sigma Q and Q true plus 2 sigma Q about 95% of the time. Slightly more precisely, 95% of the time, Q measured will fall between about Q true minus 1.96 sigma Q and Q true plus 1.96 sigma Q. So in 95% of trials, Q measured will fall within 1.96 sigma Q of Q true. We can thus define our 95% confidence interval to be those values of Q true within 1.96 sigma Q of Q measured. With this definition, 95% of constructed intervals will contain Q true. Okay, so that's how we construct the confidence interval. Now let's talk about what it means. To do this, we'll make two points. Okay, so point one. If the true value of Q, Q true, is within the 95% confidence interval, then the measured value Q measured was within the two-sided 95% band around the true value. The 95% confidence interval is the set of values for Q true for which Q measured fell within the 95% band. So it's the set of values for Q true for which Q measured fell within 1.96 sigma Q of Q true. Another way of saying this is that it is the set of values for Q true with which Q measured was consistent within 1.96 sigma Q. So it's the range of values for Q true with which Q measured had a certain well-defined level of consistency. For those of you who watched the video Frequentists versus Bayesians, this is a concept from frequentist statistics. Okay, so now for point two. We stated this point at the beginning of the video, but now we'll talk about it in more detail. If we make a measurement and construct the 95% confidence interval, that does not imply that the probability that Q true falls inside the reported interval is 95%. 
but let's also remember how we defined the confidence interval. We defined the 95% confidence interval such that if the experiment were repeated for many independent trials, and for each trial the interval was constructed, in 95% of those trials Q true would be inside the interval. So this may seem like a paradox. How are these two statements consistent? The probability of Q true falling within the constructed 95% confidence interval is 95% only if we look over the set of intervals constructed for all measurements, not just the one measurement that we actually did. Let's take a look at this. Okay, so again, if we repeated the experiment over many trials, 95% of trials would have Q measured land within 1.96 sigma Q of Q true. If we construct confidence intervals 1.96 sigma Q around Q measured, 95% of the trials will have Q measured close enough to Q true that Q true falls within the interval. These are the 95% of trials that fall within the blue band. But 5% of trials will have Q measured fall too far away for Q true to be within the interval. These are the trials that are in the tails of the distribution shown in white. So the statement about there being a 95% chance of Q true being inside the interval holds only when we look at all Q measured, not just the value from a single experiment, as it is not true for individual values of Q measured. Note that we can make such a statement about a future measurement, where Q measured is not yet known and where we don't know if it falls inside or outside the blue band. Okay, this is a tricky concept, so let's state it yet again. If the experiment were repeated for many independent trials, and for each trial the 95% confidence interval was constructed, in 95% of trials Q true would be inside the interval. But this does not imply the probability of Q true being inside a given reported interval is 95%. We can see this in another way. Let's imagine a situation where it's clear that one statement does not imply the other. Let's imagine a case where Q true is, for all practical purposes, known. For example, there may have been previous measurements of Q which were very precise and had tiny error bars. Again, Q measured will fall within 1.96 sigma Q of Q true in 95% of trials. For those trials, Q true is inside the constructed confidence interval. But if we do the experiment a single time and construct the 95% confidence interval, Q true will either be inside or outside this interval. And furthermore, as Q true is known, we can definitively say if it is inside or outside the interval we constructed. So in this case, we can see that assigning a probability of 95% to the possibility that Q true is inside the interval is clearly not correct. Instead, the probability that Q true is within 1.96 sigma Q of Q measured depends on the value of Q measured. Now, it might seem like we've cheated by hypothesizing about a scenario in which Q true is known. But if we want to make probabilistic statements about the value of Q true, 
we must switch from frequentist to Bayesian reasoning. The confidence interval is a frequentist concept, and frequentist reasoning simply does not ask questions about the true value of parameters that we measured. So to ask those questions, we must switch into Bayesian gear. Bayesian reasoning requires that we make some initial assumption about the probability distribution of Q true. This is called a prior probability distribution. Taking Q true as known, like we did here, is just a very specific prior probability distribution. We can then use that initial assumption plus the result of our experiment to make a statement about the probability that Q true is in a certain range. If we choose to do this, we are no longer constructing a frequentist confidence interval. If we want to make a statement about the probability that Q true is in a given range, we can construct what is called a Bayesian credible interval, which requires Bayes' theorem. We won't go into that here, but for more info on Bayes' theorem, you can check out the Bayesian playlist.